Hello and welcome to another episode of Two Guys in a Chainsaw. I'm Todd. And I'm Craig. After the uh, Halloween season, we're back to request time. Yep, we're going to try to fulfill a few more requests that we've gotten over this next month. And this one is a long-standing request from our long-standing listener, Manuel. And he has asked us to do Francis Ford Coppola's, one of his, his first films, Dementia 13 which mm-hmm. also happens to be a Roger Corman-produced film. And we're yep. good old friends of Roger Corman, in spirit anyway. Francis Ford Coppola is one in a long line of directors, special effects people, composers, actors, who Roger Corman's shop uh, really boosted up and into the Hollywood mainstream. And this was Coppola's first film that he that wasn't a nudie cutie. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, he did a couple of, um, yeah, just basically boob movies before this, and uh, was second, I believe, sound director or sound technician on a film that was filming by Roger Corman in Ireland. And as he was known to do, finished early and with about 20 grand left in its budget and all these actors still under contract. So Corman said uh, to Coppola, why don't you throw together a script that's basically a psycho knockoff. We want to see some bloody killings and whatever, and let's film it real fast with this leftover money. Coppola took that 20 I think it was 22000 mm-hmm. And then unbeknownst to Corman, pre-sold the European distribution rights to the movie and raised another twenty, so that he could have a little over forty grand to shoot the movie with. And he shot it in Ireland uh, with a couple of the actors who were still uh, from that other movie. Which, on the same set? Yeah. Mm-hmm, on the same set and everything, and put together this little movie called Dementia 13, which has to be like the most boringly titled Corman film ever. Like, I'm really surprised it was not like Murders at the Irish Castle or something like that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and it was originally just supposed to be titled Dementia, but I I think that uh, Coppola found out some time before release that there had been another movie in the 50s that had already been titled Dementia, so they added the 13 uh, at a later date, which I didn't know anything about this movie going in. I didn't look up anything about it. Um, but if you did look into it at all, um, you would find out that that 13 is kind of a, a key to the mystery. Mm, that's right. <laughs> if you look deeply within this um, intertwining complex plot, as you watch this film, you might, uh, you might discover a little hint. You know, this movie is really easy to come by. I... Th- I don't know for sure if it's in the public domain now, but it sure shows up along with a lot of other public domain movies in those same places. You've been able to find it at like dollar stores. I don't know if it's legitimately that way or not, but just kind of up along there with Night of the Living Dead, I've run across this film. And like I said, the same kind of place. It's always been meaning to watch it, never truly compelled to do so until Manuel asked us to do so as well. So we thought we'd give it a listen. And um, yeah, I have to say that when the movie started out, it really had a a Hitchcockian feel to it. Yeah, oh, definitely. You you could tell he was really going for a particular style here, even though the thing was shot in nine days. I mean... Oh, wow. (laughs) I didn't know that. (laughs) Like, only, like, Little Shop of Horrors was shot in a shorter amount of time (laughs) when you you look at... I think that was shot in, what, four days? I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) But, yeah, anyway, I mean, you can't fault the film too much for being... thrown together so quickly. In fact, Coppola used a co-writer on the script itself, and uh, the co-writer had said, or, or maybe it was some of the actors from the film, had said that you know the reason a lot of the dialogue in the movie is stilted and was actually difficult for the actors to get out was simply because it was such a rush job. You know, So the fact mm-hmm. that this movie is coherent at all and is even, you know, halfway good is is a bit of a miracle, I suppose. <laughs> it's yeah. a testament to you know, some pretty hard working skill, I think, that went into the cinematography and the direction from Coppola. And the actors are really pretty good for what they have mm-hmm. to work with. I mean, you'll recognize several of them. I don't know about I you. didn't. You did. Oh, okay. No, I didn't. But so I didn't write down any of their names or anything because I didn't really recognize any of them. But then afterwards, I went back and looked at uh, their IMDb pages, and a lot of these folks had been in dozens of movies throughout their career or in dozens of movies. So it's not like these are 
amateurs. You know, these are uh, pretty good actors. And I, I have to say that the performances were, were pretty strong, really, especially I particularly liked the woman who played Louise, yes. uh, who is uh, kind of the main character, especially in the beginning uh, of the movie. And Luana Anders, I, she was strong. She plays this kind of strong-willed woman. Beyond her character being written that way, I just felt like she had a particularly strong screen presence. She's very beautiful, but very beautiful in a way that didn't seem typical of this time period. She she struck me as being very modern, like somebody mm. that you would see on screen today who maybe. <sighs> I don't know how to say it because she is just a beautiful woman, but she's not kind of cookie cutter beautiful. She's got kind of a striking appearance to her and yeah. um, a, a real presence on screen. And I, I really enjoyed her. And I, I recognized, I think, the guy that played Richard. He seemed familiar to me. I, I'm not sure why, but you say, and, and I've read this too, that uh, the dialogue initially seemed very stilted. And um, I also read that when... Coppola had finished the movie. Corman saw a screening of it and was just kind of furious and and felt like it was incomprehensible and it didn't have enough of what he wanted, which was the the violence and and the shock factor. And so he, if I remember correctly, he actually hired a second director to come in and film some additional scenes to kind of make it more what he wanted it to be. And and those additional scenes, I, I know that some of them had to do with Simon the Poacher. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and really, for me, they seemed a little bit inconsequential. They could have been taken out and it wouldn't have made any difference. But the movie, as it is, is only an hour and 15 minutes long. Yeah, it needed so, something, right? Some padding. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> I understand why he felt the need to pad it. But as far as the stilted dialogue and stuff goes... You know, I, I I didn't really feel that way. I mean, it really it seemed pretty comprehensible to me. I, I didn't. I mean, there were parts when I was confused, but it's a mystery, so I felt like I was supposed to be a little bit scratching my head. But yeah, I felt like at times it was a little too on the nose, and especially toward the end, there were some really laugh out loud horrendous lines that really called attention to themselves that I'm sure we'll get to, but. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you're right, but it's it's just, it's a very talky kind of movie, and so when there's not so much action and mostly talking between the characters, they're always expositioning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, they're always expositioning every chance they get, and that to me, is, at times, just felt kind of unnatural. You know, like, why is this guy yeah. telling, suddenly telling this woman, you know, all of his, his deepest, darkest secrets because they happen to be sitting down at a fire together? Things like that. Uh, sure. Just a little unnatural, but... You, so you didn't recognize Patrick McGee, the guy who played the detective? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember there being a detective. <laughs> I'm sorry. Not detective. The doctor. The guy who okay. played the doctor. Sorry. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I, 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 for a second there, I was scratching my head like, oh, wait, man. did we watch the same movie? You know who uh, I want him to be? I want him to be the detective in Dial M for Murder, because he's like the spitting image of that guy. Yeah, I but mean, I he was he kind of familiar, but just familiar in that sinister, semi-foreign way <laughs> that, <laughs> that in, in, in movies of this era, you know, anybody who is even slightly foreign or who had something of an accent... Um, you're like, ooh, who's that guy? <laughs> <laughs> I think I recognized him the most from the 1970s version of Tales from the Crypt and a couple other of these Roger Corman movies like The Mask of the Red Death. Um, I think he was in Die, Monster, Die. He's been in a f actually a lot of horror films and a lot of these older horror films, although he's had roles in like Chariots of Fire and Barry <clears> Lyndon. <throat> He's a Tony Award winner, I read, I oh, think. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I think maybe one of the strongest, uh, except for the fact that, again, he's given a lot of silly lines to say. And uh, I don't know, we'll probably end up talking about his character as we go on, because it's um, it's pretty ambiguous It goes along as it goes along, just what you're supposed to think of this guy. Um, but before we 
t- start talking about things. You know, you had mentioned Luana Anders, and I think where I recognized her from the most is one of my wife's favorite films of all time, which is The Pit and the Pendulum, starring Vincent Price, which mm-hmm. was another Roger Corman movie just a couple years before this one. And I we've probably seen that in our house, like, I don't know, 20 times. <laughs> <laughs> and she's great in that too. She's late later on. She's an easy rider with Dennis Hopper. Um, nothing really significant, but uh, apparently did a ton of TV. Yeah, I agree with you. And I I got this feeling too. Like she almost also seemed like I don't I don't know how to say it. Like a typical Hitchcock girl, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Sort of beautiful bombshell, and, and like you say, not classically bombshell beautiful, but just has a, a certain striking beauty about her. Blonde. You know, yeah. short hair that has a a bit of a edge to her, right? Yeah, it's, it's past. And like, actually, she she reminded me, and not because she really looks like her, but she kind of reminded me of um, Jennifer Tilly uh, oh, a little yeah. bit. Just kind of like, like I don't know, she's got a really striking face. Again, doesn't look anything like Angelina Jolie, but that kind of beauty, like unexpected you know i i I don't know well i'm getting i'm trying to (laughs) make it more complicated (laughs) than it is she's very beautiful (laughs) and i I think her personality plays into that a little bit too because kind of like jennifer tilly she's got a bit of an edge to her she she looks like and and this is true of a lot of hitchcockian heroines or or Mm -hmm. anti-heroines as it tends to be where they seem like they'll be playing that role of the era you know the Oh, very proper, very kind of nice, uh, naive in some sense woman who all these things happened to, right? Mm-hmm. Like like, like mm-hmm. the birds or something or Psycho. But as it turns out, she actually is pretty headstrong and has opinions and she's not one to be messed with, I suppose, and has her own agenda. And, and that, I think, we get that from the very get-go. We don't know anything really about these two characters, uh, but we soon find out that they are married. Um, mm-hmm. And she plays a character named, like you said, Louise, and then mm-hmm. her husband John um, go out on a boat. And again, the dialogue—I'm sorry, but the dialogue's really silly right from the get-go. He's like running out there, and he's going on the boat. And she's like, "Well, where are you going?" He's like, "I'm going out to row on a, this boat by myself." <laughs> and she's like, "Well, I'll come with you too, then." <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. tell the audience everything they need to know right here. That will is no good. Your mother's still alive. We can talk her into changing it. You are always too greedy, Louise. I just don't like to see her exploiting you. John, you're rowing too hard. Let me row. You're concerned about me, Louise. Is it my heart? You're only a member of the family as long as you're my wife. If I die before mother, you're a stranger. <laughs> and, then, and then he has a heart attack and uh she's like oh you idiot <laughs> where are your pills Don't and me. he's like they're in my coat and she pulls them out and she's like it's empty you idiot <laughs> and then so she starts rowing towards shore and he's like you better row faster because if i die you're not gonna get anything he like literally <laughs> says that <laughs> yeah. there's, there's no love lost between these two clearly <laughs> And, and so, so then he dies, and so she slaps the crap out of him a couple of times, and then she's like, "What should I do?" And so she dumps his body in the lake. She says this out uh, loud, yeah, for sure. yeah. What should I do? I need to get rid of and, the body. <laughs> She's already scheming. Yeah, and and I didn't know. Like I said, I didn't read anything about this going in, so I didn't know that it was supposed to be reminiscent of Psycho. But it is. I mean, even bef- yeah. before I knew that, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so psycho mm-hmm. um, because she like we see her conniving and we hear her voice and voiceover like, what am I going to do? OK, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw him in the lake and then I'm going to write a letter to his mom and say that he got called back to New York for business and that he won't be able to come to Kathleen's memorial. But of course he'll be thinking about them. And like, we're hearing all this in voiceover as she's doing it in a motel room. <laughs> right. And so we just get all this exposition of what's going on. And, and so what she, her plan is she's going to somehow win over the mother 
And she even says, she's like, I know that I can win over the mother or I can get rid of her in some way, but his brothers, I'm not so sure, especially his older brother, Richard. I don't know. It's going to be difficult, but, um, and and so that's it. I mean, that's the setup for then, you know, what's going to happen. So, you know, initially I thought that this all happened near the castle, but I guess this happened on their way there. That must be. I don't know. Because she slips this note under a door. Right? Like, she, it says mother, and then she slips this note under a door like she's passing it into the mother's room or something. Yeah, I, I thought that it all happened at this castle. Okay, so the rest of the whole movie takes place at this castle, Castle Halloran. The mm-hmm. The family's name is Halloran. And I thought that it all happened there, too. But then stuff happened later in the movie that made me think maybe that wasn't there. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm still confused about it. Well, She's pretty dumb. I mean, like, dumping a body in a lake is guaranteeing it's going to come up in a few days. And the same thing with throwing all of his stuff in the lake. Like, <laughs> yeah. She's not real smart about it. but uh. And, she, like, she she packs it like, oh, okay, what would he take with him? Well, why wouldn't he take everything with him, first of all? But, like, she <laughs> – Everything she he packs- brought. <laughs> right. <laughs> Was he going to leave up- some of it? Was he planning yeah. on leaving? <laughs> she packs up some of his clothes and his typewriter because he'll need to – type letters on the plane um and then she just she just tosses it in the lake like from the shore like a suitcase like what do you think is going to happen <laughs> like that suitcase is just gonna be floating there in the morning <laughs> but whatever it doesn't matter nobody finds it so it's yeah. fine and we end up at a uh, castle halloran a big irish castle uh we get introduced in- to another character who is kane kane is being picked up at the airport by this guy named Billy. And Billy is one of John's brothers. So it's Billy and Richard. And it turns out that Kane is Richard's fiance. So I guess they're planning on getting married not long after Kathleen's memorial ceremony. And he picks her up, and again, they they have more dialogue where he gives her a little more information about the family, tells us the memorial ceremony is happening. Sorry that Richard couldn't come. Sorry the, that John couldn't come. You so are sorry. always... You're terrible. <laughs> I am. I'm terrible with these names, man. Especially in this... And I'll tell you, in this movie, too, that commits this sin, in my mind, it's a sin. You just can't do this in films, where you have characters that look so much alike. Like yeah, the women, two women look very identical. <laughs> they are. Like, their hair is the same color. It's almost the same style. They look... They have the same makeup. It's like, please, can you can throw me a bone here? At least make one a brunette, or like, give her a weird hairdo, or put it in a braid, or something, Right. So right. I was constantly confusing the two and, and having to kind of look back and go, wait a minute, which one was that? Well, and we get we get the exposition. Like, uh, at some point, Louise is talking to Billy, I think, and uh, he's like, how do you like Castle Halloran? And she's like, oh, it's cool, but it's it's almost like a haunted castle. And, <laughs> and he's like, well, well, it is haunted. <laughs> it's haunted by Kathleen. And like, they never really expand upon that. that. Yeah. Like it, like, is it really, or is, I, I think that maybe he's being metaphorical. Like it's haunted by her memory uh, or something along those lines. But we get this exposition about how Kathleen died when she was young and his mother never got over it. And He's like, she even had a poem. <laughs> and, then, and then he and then he recites this poem. this poem. Three sons, each who would marry and go away. But little Kathleen would always stay. <laughs> we 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 find out that at some point she drowned in the pond. And another problem. And I don't care. It's not like I'm losing sleep over it or anything. But another problem (laughs) that I have is supposedly this was only supposed to have happened seven years ago. And when it happened seven years ago, Billy was just a child. I don't know how old Richard was supposed to be. Mm. But there's no way in hell (laughs) that this guy, Billy, was a kid seven years ago. There's just no way. He was supposed to be 13, right? Yeah. Oof. Hey, you're giving away important plot twists. Mm-mm, mm-mm. <laughs> so sorry. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> there will be more. I, I didn't even I didn't even catch it until the very end, so it's yeah. fine. You're just enlightening our 
two <laughs> listeners. <laughs> but, but yeah, okay. So Manuel's she one of them, and, and he's already knows what the story. Yeah, is. he knows. <laughs> so it's all good. <laughs> yeah. So she died seven years ago, and the mom never got over it. And there's lots, like you said, there's just kind of lots of dialogue. But what ends up being exposed is that they reconvene every year here in Ireland, even though Richard and John both live and work in the United States and they recreate her funeral. Um, weird. Which, I, yeah, right. Why? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's a lot of trouble for everybody to come back year after year to throw some flowers on a grave. This is right. And, and, and Kane, the girl at one point, says i think or maybe it's louise i don't know um one of the women says why do you do this and like nobody ever answers <laughs> don't have a really good answer except <laughs> yeah. except that it's just to appease the mother really she just hasn't gotten over it and she insists on it and and then we get introduced to these characters as things go along and we don't get their names immediately or even their relationships quite immediately and they come and go at odd times so I imagine that, well, at least one of them, like you said, was thrown in after the fact uh, by yeah. Corman, just to give us another kill. There's an Irish guy who starts talking about how he's been here 20 years, and he's discussing secret passages and, and Kathleen uh, in the castle with Kate, Louise. I believe, right? Oh, I don't or is that Louise? <laughs> who knows? Who cares? <laughs> I think one of the Kate. blonde chick. Yeah, and um, and Billy talks with Kane or <laughs> Louise, one of the two, and we get lots of flashbacks to him and Kathleen playing, and so we get this notion that she drowned, uh, and Billy either witnessed it or was the last person to see her or whatever. And they see, and that's where you said things kind of being really on the nose. Like, okay, folks, things are probably going to get spoiled, so I, I'm sure you'll be terribly disappointed, but like. Th- that very first flashback where we see, okay, so they say that Kathleen died, like they were somebody random was having a wedding at the castle and Kathleen was a bridesmaid, I guess, even though she was a little girl, she, she drowned in the pond on that day. Well, we get this flashback from Billy's perspective of the two of them kind of playing and then kind of roughhousing near the edge of the water. And I'm thinking, surely this is a red herring because Mm. this makes it totally seem like Billy had something to do with her death. Like it wasn't just a simple accident. Uh, And I thought, Oh, well that's, that's too obvious. So (laughs) look, look else, look elsewhere, look elsewhere. Cause that's too obvious. No. (laughs) Yeah, not really. Oops, yeah it, it, it they they tried to to add these red herrings one of the red herrings too is richard um they make richard off to be the, the and richard is like a sculptor and i guess he brings his studio with him right right because because <laughs> because half the time we see him and the, in fact the very first time we meet him he's in a studio with a blowtorch and God knows what else, making some sculpture. And that's just kind of his domain. And his sculptures look like nothing. Like, yeah. they just look like, they just look like metal. scrap metal. It's like, like the 60s. It's, I don't know, it's modern art, right? At the time. <laughs> and, and apparently, I guess, at least this is what I took away from it, is that this is like their family craft. Like, their family has always been artisans. They traditionally had worked in stone, but I don't know, I guess Richard's a rebel or something. (laughs) Right, so he's graduated to metalwork, and and that's what he does now. But yeah, he I think is, because he's very broody, so we're supposed to question his character all the time, but I don't know. It's not particularly well-crafted as far as suspense goes. But, But meanwhile... I don't know. I don't want to be too – here I go, apologizing again. I don't want to be too critical of it because, you know, it was suspenseful. You know, I was was curious as to what was going on. I I really expected this to be more of kind of a haunted castle kind of movie than it ended ended up being. Me too. Uh, But really what it turns into – and here's uh, really where kind of the psycho influence comes in is Louise is – doing whatever she can. She's masterminding this plan to get Lady Halloran to uh, change her will. And so 
once she finds out about Kathleen, then she they have their ceremony, right, right? Right. Which is standing around in the rain under black umbrellas and tossing some flowers onto the grave. And the mother looks at the flowers, and it appears to her that one of the flowers has died as soon as it touches the grave. So she faints, which apparently she does every year. Every year. <laughs> <laughs> like they should just be standing behind her, you know, with like a blanket or something, right? I thought that was hilarious too. Like, lady, if this flower wilts every year, why are you so shocked? That you <laughs> Out every year. It's true. Uh, but but she does. And so then Louise um comes to her and she's like, There's something in this house. Like music in the hallways. Like a child's music. Asking me something. But more like begging me. It's already been established earlier on that Lady Halloran does not like either of her son's wife or fiance. Um, And she's very standoffish with them. But as soon as Louise is like, oh, I'm hearing something in the hallways, she's like, oh, okay, well, you're my best friend. (laughs) She's found her Achilles heel, apparently. Right. And, and, and I like this. I like her performance. She is very manipulative and Mm -hmm. it's strong. I like her performance. And and so she goes and on, you know, when lady Halloran's sick, sick bed, she tells her this and then she's got this plan where she roams around the house and she eventually finds Kathleen's room, which is like behind a secret door or something. It's a weird door. Yeah. It's like a window. Like, it's like she has like to climb has, in there. Right. Like it's not a door door. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's bizarre. Which I didn't get at all. And there's somebody, you know, there's these all we see is feet, but there's there's somebody kind of skulking around and like seeing her and she doesn't know it and we do, but we don't know who it is. It's a man, or at least it appears to be a man. It's men's shoes and, and she crawls in there and like there's some randomly spooky stuff that happens in there like <laughs> toys move by themselves and like there's like this wind up uh monkey with an axe and like it, it, it starts going and, toy ever and every and every time the axe chops down in the score it's like Um, But there's no explanation for why these toys are just randomly going off for themselves. And Louise is not at all disturbed by it. She's like, oh, okay, whatever. (laughs) You know, you're thinking that he's just trying to squeeze in some jump scares. And I think that was probably the intent. But also, like you said, they go nowhere. It's not like there's this tension like she's going to be interrupting anything or going to be heard. Right, right. Okay, so so she gathers up a few of these toys. And I, I have to say that this is probably my favorite part of the movie. In fact, I was kind of getting kind of excited at this mm. point. And she, she gathers up some of these toys and she goes down to the pond that's on their property where Kathleen drown and i didn't know what she was doing but she ties up these toys all up in these twine ties them together and then ties them to a wrench and i'm like okay all right so she's gonna anchor these toys in the pond somehow but you know what's that gonna be well then she rubs something on the twine and and i didn't really understand what was going on but i'm like okay all right you know interesting whatever and then she starts strips taking off her, her clothes off. She strips off all of her clothes, which I thought was really pretty racy for the I time, so right? Too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, she's just in her broad panties at that. Point. Yeah, and and I and of course, you know, she's gorgeous. She looks great, but I just for the time, I was like, ooh, that's kind of racy. Mm-hmm. And then, so she dives into the pond with this thing that she's created and she plants it in the bottom and at that point i'm thinking okay probably whatever she put on the twine that's something that's going to eat away at it so uh, these things pop up uh, you know in the ponds and, and that is what happens but this is where things took a total turn for me okay so she she's swimming underwater and you know this is what the 50s right yeah, uh, yeah 60, I, I, late, early 60s yep I thought that these underwater shots were really cool. They were. <laughs> and you know, 
I am a sucker for underwater photography. I will watch any movie if it has underwater photography in it. I don't care. And you know, we've reviewed some great. We've reviewed a you know a zombie attacking a shark underwater. Right, right. Uh, I, I'm always glued to the screen when this when this stuff comes up. It looked really good. I was impressed. And by the way, I okay. So you said this movie is available everywhere, and it is. You know, I, I looked on YouTube, and it's posted. You know, I don't know half a dozen times on YouTube, and I found one version that had excellent video quality. I mean, it was so clean. It had to be some sort of restored version. It was just, it was beautiful. It was, I mean, it looked almost like it could have been shot yesterday in black and white. It was so beautiful, but the sound wasn't great. And the sound kept cutting in and out. So then I had to, in a different window on my computer, I had to pull up another (laughs) version that had much better audio quality, but much worse visual quality. So anytime the, uh, the sound would go out on the good video one. I would switch to Are the bad video me? one. Wow. <laughs> this is dead. <dedicated. laughs> well, and I wouldn't, if I didn't care, I would have just watched the bad video one. But the, the video on the good video one was so, so clean good. and so good. I, I didn't want to miss it. And especially in this part, like it yeah. was just real, this underwater stuff. I mean, it was really good, especially for the time. Okay, so she's swimming around underwater and then she sees something and it's intentionally distorted. Like we can't, or at least. The one that I watched, it was. Like, I couldn't really tell what it was that she saw. But it scares her, and she screams underwater, and then she swims back up to the surface, to the edge of the pond, and all of a sudden, there is an axe murderer there, and he kills her fairly brutally. I mean, the violence is – it's mostly suggested, but you definitely get the – hint that she's kind of getting (laughs) chopped up and then she's dead and like i said like i've already said two or three times i knew nothing about this going in but at this point i'm like oh my god this is totally psycho Mm -hmm. because our main character is getting killed halfway through the movie and i didn't expect it at all i didn't see it coming from a mile away and I was like, "Oh man, that's awesome!" <laughs> yeah, I had the same. I had the same reaction. I was like, "Okay, now I really don't know where this movie is going." You right. Know, I guess it's going to be about this axe murder, but yeah, that came completely out of left field. It was fantastic. Yeah, I loved that. I thought that was fantastic. And and whatever, I, what I read was that. Corman specifically wanted kind of a psycho knockoff. And in that way, in the way that they kill off the main character halfway into the movie, it certainly is. But beyond that, I mean, they're completely different stories. You know, it's, it's not like it's cookie cutter copy. Um, Yeah. So I, I, I don't discredit it, you know, for, for being a knockoff, even though I know that that was kind of Corman's wheelhouse, you know, he, he, did that, but, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, whatever, it's fine. Anyway, so moving forward, it kind of does become the mystery of who is the psycho axe killer. Right. They have lunch uh, out on the lawn, and we this is, I think, around the time we get to meet the doctor. Uh, we saw the doctor a little bit earlier who is consulting. And, and it's funny because this doctor, I guess, is also a bit of an amateur psychiatrist or something. He's really trying to diagnose the mother's mind as well. And the doctor's a very interesting character, I think, in this, in that when he comes on, and I think this is a scene before this, but it's really worth talking about, when he's talking with the mother, he's really trying to tell her to let go. Consider your mind as a bird in your hand. When it's relaxed, it lies quiet and easy. But when it's tense and frightened, it strains to leave you. What I want you to do is to rest and to relax your mind. Remember the uh, bird in your hand? Then he says some really strange things to, and I think it's just the -the on-the-nose writing, but when they're looking for Luis, the mother asks for Luis. Mm -hmm. It's because, you know, of this earlier thing. I guess she wants to find Luis to see if she... Um, has heard anything more from her dead daughter. Right. And uh, the maid comes in, and the the doctor's like immediately on this. And my daughter-in-law, Louise. She isn't in her room. I don't think she slept there last night, if you were to ask me. Yeah, but nobody's asking you, little girl. Uh, Hurry up with the lunch, or I'll wish five years of spinsterhood on you. I must know where Louise is. 
I never noticed this interest in your daughter-in-law before. I don't know. It's just, it's just, it's just a pile of bizarre dialogue. But the end result of all this is, I'm thinking, okay, are they trying to cast suspicions on the doctor? Yeah, I mean, you he's know? just creepy. He's, he's just creepy in general. And I got the sense that it's not so much that he cared about the well-being of this family at all it was more that he was just concerned about analyzing them you know like it doesn't really seem like he cares about them at all it's or or about what happens to them or or whatever but just like he wants to figure it out (laughs) and he'll do that however he needs to because he has just sort of a detached aloofness about everything that's going on super analytical and he uh, professes to care, but then in the things he says, he's really pretty blunt and brutal and just kind of – he doesn't have very good bedside manner, this doctor. No. Yeah, that's why <laughs> That's why I was thinking of him as a detective through the whole thing. It, it's like yeah. the role that he played. You're right. <laughs> it, it's true. He, he is like that. And y- you're right. So, okay, so they all have breakfast together, and the toys – pop up in the pond and everybody's you know what's happening the mom is like i don't even know how she got this like the mom looks at all these toys floating up and she's like kathleen wants a tiara what (laughs) (laughs) it's a a message clear as day from beyond (laughs) give me my tiara mom these four dolls and i feel like billy has another kind of very brief flashback at that point or something back again, just to him and Kathleen at the edge of the water or whatever. The mom goes and gets this tiara, this beautiful diamond tiara. And she's like, I, I wanted to bury it with you, but they wouldn't let me. So I'm going to take it to your playhouse, which we've never heard of before, but she goes out and apparently there's this playhouse out on the property somewhere and um, it's got all of Kathleen's stuff in it, but she goes out there and then Kathleen is in there. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Like, like Kathleen's body. And she's like, I, I wanted to bury it with you, but they wouldn't let me. So I'm going to take it to your playhouse, mm-hmm. which we've never heard of before. But she goes out and apparently there's this playhouse out on the property somewhere and um, it's got all of Kathleen's stuff in it, but she goes out there and then Kathleen is in there. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> like, like Kathleen's propped body propped up, perfectly preserved, certainly doesn't look like it's been dead and buried for seven years. It's just sitting there and she sees it and she's like, <gasps> and then all of a sudden the ax murderer shows up and the ax murderer just starts like tearing down the playhouse, it's the playhouse. It's like an outdoor playhouse thing. It's like a shed almost. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so the ax murderer tears it down and she escapes and, and Remarkable. she runs away and she, right. And she passes out on the lawn and Kane and the female maid, I don't remember her name, find her first. And they're like, where's Richard? Where's Richard? Where could he be? Where could he be? Like, <laughs> Hint, hint, hint. <laughs> right? That's right. Everybody so comes out. After a while, the doctor and Richard and Billy all show up and they take the mom inside. And, um, you know, the whole last, whatever, half hour of this movie or whatever is just this this mystery yeah. and 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 then that this is where it gets padded there's a whole scene and it's a long scene with yeah. Simon the poacher who sees like, like <laughs> Simon the poacher seen, with the worst irish accent you've ever heard in your oh life god the <laughs> worst irish accent and i'm pretty sure a fake mustache too it's only old bushy tail I'm after me so rough i swear by the shade of Finn McCool, master billy i'm not poaching your legal game no, it is only that no good rabbit stealing fox what brings me here. Please, Master Billy. For the memory of your late great father, God rest his soul. Don't turn me over to the bulls. But he's like sees movement in the brush. But I, I wouldn't want to live near Simon the poacher because he just sees leaves moving and starts shooting into them like <laughs> <laughs> That's right. 
<laughs> he poaches but everything in sight, this guy. Right. But there's this scene that it has to go on for five minutes oh. where he's just like army crawling in the woods near the pond and he keeps well, seeing things moving, but he can't find what it is. And then an owl scares him. And then he <laughs> crawls and then he crawls into some sort of like den or something. And then Kathleen's body is in there and he's like, ah, and so he scurries out. <laughs> and then and then the axe murderer chops off his head. In, in, in hindsight, in, in having read about it afterwards, like it's so obvious that this was a scene that was just cut in to give them another kill because it's yeah. entirely inconsequential. But it's pretty – again, it's also a little brutal for the time, I think, and especially for Roger Corman movie, which could tend to be bloody. But again, you have to put that in its context for the time. Nothing Roger Corman ever put out was as near – even approached bloodiness that we would call today. But, you know, the head – the head gets chopped and rolls and um, yeah and i think at this point and i still i gave the movie a lot of credit because i thought okay we've seen now these three kills by a, an axe murderer and now it's about an axe murderer you <laughs> know like i mean the with the first one the person who killed louise wanted to kill louise you know like they had a thing against louise and wanted her out of the picture right but then by the time this random dude wandering around in the woods gets his head cut off it's like okay this is a movie about some guy that just who's who's gonna kill everybody by the end of this if he's not stopped and so my mind was really you know you're always looking for motive and uh at this point i was completely confused like okay there's clearly no motive you know, we're talking about, again, a psycho situation or something like that. And and so I, I actually give the movie a lot of credit, whether this movie was – this part was inserted or not, that the mom was almost hacked, that this guy was killed, that she was killed. And now I really had no idea what was going on. True. It was very unpredictable. Let's put it that yes. way. Yes. Yeah. I, I totally agree. And it kept my interest for that reason. Yeah. <laughs> frankly and i want to be nice manuel because i know that this is one of your favorite movies it's it's not one of my favorite movies and when i saw that it was only an hour and 15 minutes I was like oh good <laughs> <laughs> i love short movies <laughs> it, it, it didn't feel that short <laughs> it felt longer than it was that that's not to say that i didn't enjoy it i did think that there were good things going on and at this point in the movie i was i was still interested you know who's it gonna be how's it gonna play out even though i felt like well it's got to be richard or billy or the doctor i guess there were times when i thought maybe it's the doctor maybe he's you know trying to throw people off but um there was kind of a limited pool you know i didn't expect it to be something out of left field like oh it's the dad who's been dead for three you know like yeah the next couple things that happen are are really just kind of dumb i mean there's really no logic behind them i think billy can't sleep and he's up late and he's talking with kane about his nightmares i'm always a little boy and i'm in my room it's late i hear somebody outside making a kind of a scraping sound i get out of bed look out of the window and there's a man climbing up the wall coming closer toward my window I yell for my mother, and she comes into the room just as the man is coming in through the window. I hold onto her legs, crying. I'm so small, I only come up to her waist. The man is in the shadows. You can almost recognize him, but not really. He says that he's insane, and that someone else in the room is insane also, and that he's going to nod his head. And when he does, that other insane person will nod their head. And so then his mom picks him up and takes him out and throws him in the pond. And then, like, as an afterthought... What's wrong? Nothing. You just made me realize the man in my dream who climbs up my wall is Richard. I'm sorry. I just never thought of it before. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. So bad. So bad. And then, for reasons I can't, I still don't understand, Arthur decides that the pond needs, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's his name. The doctor decides that the the pond needs to be drained. Oh, yeah, right, right. Arthur's the groundskeeper, right. right. And so he tells Arthur to drain it, and he's like, I don't know how. And he's like, 
well, here's some keys and this is how you do it. <laughs> so, he, so he drains the pond. <laughs> Whatever, right? And I'm not sure what he was expecting to find, but it seemed like he found exactly what he expected to find because what he unearths is what scared the what scared Luis when she was under yeah. there, which is a almost like a tombstone. And it says, forgive me, Kathleen. And at this point, if you haven't figured out who the killer is, you're really dense. Yeah. Right. Uh, there's only one person who can be racked with guilt over Kathleen. Exactly. But they still they're still trying really really hard to make you think that it's Richard yeah. even though it pretty it pretty obviously isn't. This was <laughs> <laughs> This was the point where I was confused because I thought surely when they drained the pond they would find John's body. Yes. Exactly. It, but In they don't. Suitcase, whatever else. Right. Right, so I, I guess you must be right that wherever she dumped John was not at the place. I, I thought for sure that she had dumped him in the pond, but I mean, apparently, apparently not. And not just John's body, but Louise's body. Hello. Yeah. And yeah, the, right. The poacher's head. I mean, they <laughs> right. Where are all these bodies going? You know, like. <laughs> They, I didn't, at this point, nobody really gives a rat's ass that Louise is gone, by the way. Like, like not really. Written her off as stealing the silverware and skipping town. Right. So this happens, and, you know, they find this tombstone, and the doctor is like, Your family are all artisans, right? And he's looking at Richard, and Richard's <laughs> like, You know that I work in metal. <laughs> <laughs> And the doctor is like, yeah, but that shrine looks like it's six or seven years old and you were still working in stone at that time. The doctor knows so Uh, much about this family. Yeah. And so then Richard goes skulking around through some catacombs. (laughs) 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 Which I guess are in the castle. And uh, Kane is following him and they end up in this room that has all of these beautiful like busts and um, stone sculptures. And it's, I guess he tells her when she reveals herself because a rat scares her or something. um, He's like, this is my dad's studio. Um, I was just, I was trying to figure out who made that shrine and she's like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I ever doubted you. I'll never doubt you again. Let's get married right now. (laughs) (laughs) But, but then as the camera backs out out away from the two of them embracing Kathleen's body again is in the foreground. What? (laughs) What does this mean? I know. I didn't get it either. Okay, and so then uh, the doctor takes Billy out for a drink. <laughs> and and this part, oh God, maybe it's just, maybe my mind goes to strange places, but <laughs> this, it seemed oddly seductive to me. Like... <laughs> He was ta- like he was taking out this young boy and and young boy he's not that young he's a man but significantly younger than the doctor and he takes him to this bar and they're under the guise of they're looking for Louise mm-hmm. but that clearly isn't uh, the reason and he he gives uh, the <laughs> Billy a drink and Billy's like no I don't drink and he's like come on it's Ireland. And he's- <laughs> <laughs> Right. And as a doctor, of course, he's like, it's right. really the only medicine you can take around here. The right. <laughs> only thing that'll get you through this is alcohol. So he's plying, he's plying this young guy with liquor, which is weird. Okay, and then that's where the seductive part ends, but I thought it was kind of weird. Yeah. And, and, then, and then he's like, you're the only one who saw Kathleen drown. And Billy's like, no, I didn't. And the doctor's like, yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> and Billy says, "No, I didn't." And the doctor says, "Yes, you did, because you told me." <laughs> Richard, tell me what happened. What happened to Louise? Fishy, fishy in the brook. Daddy caught you on a brook. Fishy, fishy in the brook. Daddy caught you on a hook. 
And supposedly when Billy was a kid and having all these nightmares in his delirious state, he had confessed this. Okay, well, if that's the case, why are you just bringing it up now? Yeah, like, exactly. It doesn't exactly. make any sense. Yeah. Listen to the words of the song because they're important. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it cuts immediately. I thought it was going to be a flashback. I thought it was a flashback to the wedding where Kathleen died. I did too. Um, but then I had to scratch that out because it wasn't because it was the res- wedding reception for Richard and Kane, which apparently they threw a wedding together right quick. Jumps forward in time, like, I don't know, months later? Who knows? It's just kind of... Yeah. I thought it was like the next day. I thought they were just... <laughs> like, while well, Billy and the doctor were at the bar, they just threw a wedding together. <laughs> it plays like the next day for sure. <laughs> And so then the doctor has this super creepy, creepy ass conversation with Kane. You know, the one thing in the world that really chills my bones to the marrow is when a pretty girl in a wedding dress looks at me and finds me repulsive. Oh, don't be silly, doctor. Oh, I'm often silly. One of my major vices. Another one is a desire on my part to help others, however, and set that mess up. Then you can help me by telling me where Richard is. I'm not sure where Richard is. Oh, indeed, uh, what he is. <laughs> <laughs> You are such a creeper. Yeah. And and she's like and she's like, uh yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> uh. It's it's another one of these really funny moments where okay, apparently time has passed and he's now trying to convince her that the family is bad news. Right, right. Uh, really? Now no. <laughs> your, your timing is just really poor on all this. So Kane and Richard run off for a romp in the hay literally, <laughs> literally like, uh, some new location that we didn't Never know about before. before yeah the doctor is walking around and like he's just on the estate and he sits down and he starts thinking about the song Ugh. that billy was singing and he's like wait a second on a hook <laughs> and so he goes so he goes i guess to the meat locker honestly this made no sense to me whatsoever this is the biggest leap in logic and there is the body and again i wasn't even sure who it was at first i thought it was kane i thought kane had been murdered and it's louise's body all bloody and gross hanging up on a hook next to like the slab of beef or whatever yeah in this shed on the property (laughs) and there's this body again of Kathleen there at her feet and so he yeah. picks it up and walks out with it and at this moment I'm thinking okay so the doctor is the killer? I was there too. This is this MO I mean at this point you realize this body has been at almost every murder except in the foreground of the catacomb scene where right. who knows why, still who knows why it was there and why an axe murder didn't leap in after it either but anyway yeah and then he he brings it outside to the grounds to the it's by this fountain or something in the garden and then everybody in the wedding party comes out and sees it and screams and then out leaps billy with an axe and tries to murder kane Kane. who's the one who screamed first at the body and and basically at the end of this the doctor has to explain it all to us you know in three lines of dialogue just before the credits go Meadow Axe Dog, something to protect, to relieve his guilt. And so it was really just the fact that each of these people happened to stumble upon this wax figure as Billy was moving it about the the castle grounds that caused them to get axed. Right. And the doctor figured this all out somehow, even though this would have been the first time that he had seen the wax figure or anybody knew anything about the wax figure, his plan was then to lure him out by taking him right. out into the garden. So it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty convoluted. Yeah, so, right. So y- we get the 30-second flashback where we see that in their rough housing, Billy had somehow, unintentionally, I guess, knocked Kathleen into yeah. the water, but then she died, and that's why she was so he was so guilty or whatever. And then he's like, this Kathleen is just a wax figure, and he takes the axe and smashes her face. <laughs> <laughs> the end. And, like, literally, the end. Roll the credits after yeah. the smashed face doll. It's just so we could have a credits rolling over a still image of uh, what looks like a woman with an axe in her face, yeah. 
Right, right. Yeah. I don't I don't know. Like I I don't think this movie's bad. No, I I, not. I I think it's I think it's perfectly fine, you know? Like there you know, Todd, and anybody who's listened to us for any period of time knows that I'm just really not much into these old movies. I'm just not that much into it. It's not my thing. Mm -hmm. But it's Hitchcockian. It's reminiscent of Psycho. Uh, and Francis Ford Coppola, you know, went on to be one of the most celebrated directors of our time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is this is his first real effort. Like you said, he had done some booby flicks before this but this was kind of his first real film and he was doing it under some pretty tight restrictions as far as time and budget and he didn't even really have any control over casting or location or anything like that and so considering all of those things it's a pretty darn good movie you know it really is. And in fact, and you know, I love these kinds of movies, actually. Yeah, um, yeah. And I've seen a lot of Corman's output. And this is right in his wheelhouse. Make it color instead of black and white, mm -hmm. right? Throw Vincent Price in there. Pad it out like hell with people wandering through the empty castle a lot more. And a few more jump scares. And a little bit more of a suspicion about a ghost or something supernatural happening. And this is just like any one of a half a dozen of his other movies that just got a little more money thrown at them and had a little more time involved. Sure. Uh, strip that all away from those movies and you end up with this movie, uh, which is, again, it's a little pot boiler. It's got a little silliness, but you can really chalk it all up to the fact that they shot the freaking thing in nine days with $40,000. And considering that, some really strong performances. I mean, the actors here are, are, are pretty darn good. Uh, I have to say um, there were some scenes, especially, you know, some of these dialogue scenes where it was kind of close up on a couple of characters having back and forth where I thought their performances were really strong, mm -hmm. um, surprisingly strong for the, the type of movie that this is. Well, there's a remake. I don't know if it's out. It's out. It's, I think it's is out. It out now. You can rent it for four ninety nine on YouTube. <laughs> ah, I'm kind of curious to see it, to be honest, because I think this is this is a movie again. At its core, it's not a bad idea. Put some time and some money and some effort into it, and make a better script, and uh, it would be really interesting. I think. I don't know. I watched the trailer. It doesn't look very good. <laughs> 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 but I don't know. It could it could be a surprise? Uh, I, I'm yeah. not gonna. I'm not. I'll wait until it's free on YouTube, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and then I'll let you know. <laughs> well, thank you, Manuel, for suggesting this. We certainly felt it was worth worthy of our time and worthy of discussion. Yeah, and thank you for being a loyal listener. We appreciate that. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can please share it with a friend. We have lots of other back episodes you can check out. We're on Google Play, we're on iTunes, we're on Stitcher. Uh, anywhere you can find podcasts, we're, we're there. And also, we have a Facebook page and a web page. If you like what you heard here, drop us a note, let us know. Let us know what you thought of this film. Give us some suggestions for other films to see. Also, we're starting to put up some written reviews to supplement the podcast that we do, um, written by yours truly right now. Please check those out. Those come out every Thursday on our website, and you can see those posted on our Facebook page as well. Until next time, I'm Todd. And I'm Craig. With two guys and a chainsaw.